San Francisco Jazz Festival, Mel Martin had a conversation with Benny Carter about Benny's remarkable life in jazz. Hello, you know Mr. Mel Martin? In my mind, San Francisco's most accomplished musician. Uh, he wants me to talk about my life in American music. Uh, it's going to be very brief. It's been such a long one so far, so far, so far. And uh, Mel and I are going to converse here a bit about the things in the music world, things that we're doing, and have been doing, and going to be doing. Benny's uh, first saxophone down there was a C melody, a Busher C melody saxophone. And uh, just the other day we were talking about this very instrument. I asked him uh, who his first real influence was, and uh, you might want to talk about that. Well, of course, it was Frankie Trumbar who at the time played the C melody saxophone. And I think when I first heard him play it, I'd never heard it before, you know. For, uh, For those of you that don't know, a C melody is all saxophones are pitched in various keys, alto and baritone in the key of E-flat, tenors and sopranos in the key of E-flat. Well, a C melody saxophone, which was made in the early, very early 20s, is pitched in the key of C. It is about halfway between an alto and a tenor. It's smaller than a tenor, larger than and deeper than an alto. And it's a very, if you're a saxophone player, it's a very strange sound. There were, no, there were no alto players around. You know, I think Johnny Hodges started shortly after that with Duke Ellington. But I don't remember. What, what that was that you were, you were telling me about a guy you heard in New York? Oh, Leonard Fields. Leonard Fields. Yes, but he wasn't a stylist. But he was a great, he had a great facility on the instrument. He was like a virtuoso, really. But he was no one after whom I could pattern uh, something. But there, I don't know, there weren't, weren't that, there weren't that many around. That's, that's why I marvel at Coleman Hawkins. I don't know where he got, <laughs> where he got, where he got it from, because there were no tenor players around. None that I remember. Well, there was Happy Caldwell. If uh, some of you jazz historians might recognize that name. Knocking a jug. Ah, there you go. There you go, righto, righto. There's Happy Caldwell. And then, of course, this was, he was in a considerably different bag than, than Hawkins developed. And you actually played the trumpet. You still play the, although I know you're not practicing it currently, you still play trumpet and have played it throughout the years. As uh, uh, for many of you that don't know, it's very difficult to play a brass instrument and a saxophone. Uh, they're, they're kind of opposite, what you call embouchures, the way you play them. Uh, well, frankly, that's the thing that makes it a little less difficult, the fact that the embouchures are different. Mm -hmm. You know, so one embouchure doesn't necessarily disturb the other, but the, the main thing is that you're going to be able to devote equal time to each instrument. If you're going to practice a couple of hours on the saxophone, you've got to practice a couple of hours on the trumpet. And at night when you're in the bandstand, if you're going to play the saxophone, you've got to play the trumpet quite a lot too, you know, or else Use it or lose it. The old thing. How many years were you in, in uh, Europe? Oh, I was in Europe almost three years. That, that includes my stint in uh, uh, London with the BBC. That was up to about 36, 38? Oh, no, that, that was uh, 38, about mid-38. Uh -huh. I went there mid-35, and I was there. That's where you actually formed one of the first fully integrated jazz bands, as I understand. Uh, the first one that I knew of, mm -hmm. so someone said, you know. But it wasn't there, it was actually in Holland. Because in, in the summer of 1937, I, I played in Holland for three months, and I had an orchestra there. I'm curious, Benny, when you came back, um, a lot of the things that you had really started doing before you left, became very popular music of that day. And I know, in fact, that when, you know, you eventually wrote for a lot of those bands, Benny Goodman, the Dorseys, and many of the bands of that time. How did you feel when 
you came back and you saw things that you had started, literally, the way you wrote for saxophones and big band arranging, having really taken off like that. Well, I don't know. I can't take credit for having started any of that. I'm sure there were many other people doing it uh, as well, maybe even better, and maybe earlier. But if, if somebody that uh, sort of uh, following the history of the music uh, claim this, I won't dispute it. Uh, but I don't know. I, I have worked a lot, as you say, in the movies. I've worked very little in the movies. I've worked considerably in the background doing film music. I quit the Hollywood scene when they refused to give me a leading man part. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite Lena Horn. <laughs> Just you, babe. For some reason, they didn't think I was the type. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was very interesting what I had to do there, and I worked on some good projects, and uh, I had good opportunity to... The, the, the interesting thing about <clears throat> writing for film, writing film music, is that in the process of writing uh, for a particular assignment, you come across a lot of things that you would not otherwise have written in addition for what you're writing as thematic material for the film. And uh, I have some things that I play now that things I would not have written had I not been doing, you know, a, a film music. And in addition to that, are things that I wrote specifically for the film also. Of course, I, I played with Coleman. Oh, in the very early 30s, in the late 20s, in the, we sat by, side by side in the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra. Um, let's see, was there anyone else in that group that I played with before? I don't think so. I never played with Phil Woods, I never played Charlie with Phil Rouse. Rouse, never played with Charlie, I never played with Dick Kirk on the piano, I never played with uh, <coughs> Papa Joe Jones, I never played with uh, Jimmy Garrison. Oh, but I had played with the... Uh, uh, John Collins. John Collins was a member of a sextet that I had in 1941, and another one of the, the members of that sextet was Dizzy Gillespie. Sure, I, I enjoyed it, particularly was interesting about that because uh, Bob Field, who was a producer on that, uh, had an idea of recreating a couple of things that uh, Coleman and I had done in Paris in 1937 with two French players. Uh, they were considered the number one altoist and tenor player, uh, Alex Combell on tenor, and, uh, oh, what's his name? Who knows the name of the alto player? Oh, Willie Smith, no. Oh, no. Where are you jazz aficionados? <laughs> and Andre Ekion. He was the alto player. Actually, he was, he was Algerian, but he was a great player. So we had done this, uh, recording at that time. We had Django Reinhardt on guitar with that and had uh, Stefan Grappelli on piano. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Tommy Benford on uh, drums and Louis Vola on uh, bass. But when, uh, oh, I think when um, Bob Field wanted to do this, do this recreation, I was in New York conducting uh, and I didn't even have an instrument with me, but he he, he wanted to do it, and he said he could get the musicians together. And so we did it. I borrowed a horn, and then we did it. I was particularly glad that we could get Phil Rouse, and uh, I mean Phil Woods and Charlie Rouse. It was fun, really fun. Well, you know, the strange thing about it is, I, I must admit, I, I never had a goal. I just wanted to play. And if I could make a living at it, I was happy. And uh, I was very fortunate, you know, people have been very good to me, you know, and uh, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of evidence out here that you've influenced uh, the music in many ways, and I know you disclaim that, and uh, 
mere conversation about it, but uh, it's backed up by my ears hearing the phrases of uh, Charlie Parker, and we were talking about Cannonball Adderley the other day. Oh, boy. Yes. My, fav my favorite. Your favorite was Cannonball? Yeah. My favorite, and then uh, Phil Woods. Phil Woods. I know you guys get along very well. sure. Yeah. Back several years ago, I did this study and actually did a book on creativity of elderly jazz musicians. On what kind of jazz musicians? <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, wait a minute, what's that again? <laughs> People past 65, okay. Mature. Experience. <laughs> uh, stick around, they'll be here. <laughs> That's all right. Could I add a couple of words in here to this? Uh, you know, I never think of Benny as elderly, and the reason is is because he's always totally present. Whenever I call him up on the phone, or we're traveling, or working together, he's one of the guys. He's right there. He knows everything that's going on with the band. He understands every aspect of the musician's attitudes, and you know, the creativity is something that you don't really turn on and off like a faucet, you know. It doesn't just sort of, you leave it alone and you let it happen. You, fl you, fl you have to flow with creativity. That says it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that Mr. Carter puts down very clearly for anybody inside is that you work on your music, you don't form a lot of opinions about your place in history or whatever. You just do the very best you can, keep your mind together, and that is uh, a secret for survival that uh, many of us uh, to this day hold as our standard for uh, how to do it, how to survive in this business. It's a tough business in a tough world, and he's done it with the utmost indignity and uh, grace and um, his sights are always set, in my mind, his sights are always set very high on musical goals.